Tonight's story, Mars. Mars. Hi everyone and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn. And I'm Christina. And we are part of the Nightlife team at Cal Academy in San Francisco. For those of you that are new, Nightlife is our weekly Thursday night events where we mix science with some creatures, cocktails, music, and more. Um, night School is our at-home version, virtual version, where Christina and I bring you some science friends every week, minus the cocktails. Um, so we'll have a new theme every week, and this week we are exploring Mars. Um, yeah, and just I just want to say it's wonderful to see where everybody's tuning in from. Montana, Modesto, Sacramento. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always fun. Um, but anyway, so tonight, um, if you don't know that much about the Mars rover and the current Mars mission that's happening right now, you're in the right place because we're going to give you a little overview of all that. And if you have been following along, you're also in the right place because we have some really amazing engineers that are here who, who worked on the mission who can tell you all the detail that you want to know probably. Um, so first up, we have a returning guest, uh, Mary Holt from the Academy, Academy's Morrison Planetarium. Um, and she's gonna give a real quick overview of the last 50 years of Mars exploration and then what's going on on the red planet today. So again, if you need a little refresher, listen to Mary. Um, and then uh, space roboticist, Dr. Vandy Verma is here. She's the chief engineer for robotic operations for the Mars Perseverance Rover. Uh, she's been driving Mars Rover since 2008, and she'll talk about just how her team does it and the robotic and autonomous capabilities involved. And then uh, engineers Dorsa Shirazi and Winnie Kwong are here from NASA Ames in Silicon Valley. Um, they both worked on the development of the Ingenuity Mars helicopter, which is set to attempt its first flight in just a few days here. So this is a very exciting time for, to have them here. And then finally, um, if you happen to catch the recording of what Martian wind sounds like, um, you have Jason Achilles to thank. Uh, he's a rock musician by day but helped engineer the microphone that would be incorporated on board the Mars rover. So um, yeah, we're super excited. It's gonna be a packed program. Um, yeah. <laughs> as, as always, uh, tonight's program is live. So say hi in the chat. Um, let us know what snacks you're eating. Um, if it's your first time watching or if you're a night school regular, um, we'll have a couple of Q and A's after everyone's talk. So make sure to get all your questions ready. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to Mary.
All right. Thank you, Lynn and Christina. Hello, everybody. Welcome to night school. My name is Mary. Um, and as uh, that wonder, wonderful introduction uh, just said, uh, I work for the planetarium at the California Academy of Sciences in the Morrison Planetarium. And I'm here to just give you kind of a quick overview of all the missions that we've been sending to Mars for over 50 years now. And basically the presentation I'm gonna give you tonight is kind of an abridged version of a nightlife show that I gave in the planetarium uh, a little over, almost two years ago now, like a year and a half ago. Um, that was mostly birthed by my own ignorance because I work in the planetarium, I have studied astronomy, I love space, but I realized that I didn't know a lot about the different missions that went to Mars. Like I didn't even know how many went or when they went and uh, what all that was about. So that was kind of the inspiration for this uh, initially. And as I did all my research on it, I was surprised to find that there's actually been quite a lot of failures along the way. And this kind of golden age of Mars exploration that we live in now is pretty recent within the last 20-ish years, I would say. So humans have been looking at Mars probably as long as we've been looking at the sky. It was one of those kind of wandering stars people thought of it. Uh, the word planet actually comes from the word wanderer uh, in Greek. And for a long time though, it did just look like one of the other stars that you might see in the sky, except that it moved a bit differently. But um, if we wanna share my slides, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, that's when we started to get better telescopes, right? And we started to be able to see Mars in a little bit more detail. So throughout a lot of the 1900s and definitely the late 1800s, this might be what you would see if you don't look through the best telescopes that we had at the time. So you can definitely see some features. You can see, looks like maybe there's a white area on the bottom there, maybe some darker and lighter areas. Then there were areas that looked like maybe canals or rivers and things like that. So people were very intrigued. And as we started to get this first, like more detailed glimpse of Mars, people got creative and they came up with all sorts of ideas of what might be there. And this started a big explosion in uh, people's interest in Mars. And this is just a quick slide showing a few uh, books that were made throughout the uh, like mid 1900s, early 1900s of uh, science fiction that featured Mars. So people have been excited about Mars for a long time. But if we jump forward to the 50s and 60s and we enter the space race. Now, if you're like me, you probably just thought of the space race as being Apollo, Sputnik, and the race to the moon, right? That was it. But it turns out that we were also sending things to Mars at the same time. So now I'm gonna switch over to my planetarium software here that I would normally use in the dome. Um, and we're going to explore some of those missions. So I'm gonna bring up some markers to show where some of those launched from. And uh, as I was looking into these ones, this is when I started to realize, wow, there's been a lot of things that we have sent to Mars, but not always too successful, unfortunately. So uh, I'm these days, you know, we send things to Mars and it's almost kind of boring in a way. I, went, I don't think it's boring, but it's rather ubiquitous, right? You hear about a Mars mission, it's like, oh yeah, that's normal. We send things to Mars and things orbit Mars, things rove around on Mars, that's normal. But that has not been normal for very long. And back then we sent, or from the 50s until 2018, we sent a total of roughly 60 robots to Mars. But do you wanna guess how many of those 60 actually were successful? about half, only about 30 of those robots successfully made it to Mars and did what they saw out to do. So I'm gonna put up some markers on the Earth to show us where some of the earliest missions were. And these markers, um, all of the markers that I'm gonna have up are just where um, these different missions were and whether or not they were successful. And Sorry, I'm getting lost in my buttons here. There we go. And the very earliest ones that were sent uh, launched
Okay, um, Mary, I don't know if you can hear me, but it looks like you might be frozen. So I don't know. Sorry, everyone, I, don't, I know nothing about Mars, so I can, can't take over. I don't know. Let's see if we can. Uh... Okay, we're gonna, we're just gonna try to reboot here for a second, everyone. Okay. Um, so she had to, so Mary had to pop off for a sec, but we're just gonna put on, um, we're just gonna put on our waiting room, our, our cool music again. Um, and she'll be back as soon as she can. Sorry, everyone. Internet. <laughs>
Hello again. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> so it would appear that my computer just couldn't quite handle uh, having about 5 billion tabs open at the same time. So we are we are restarting right now and uh, I'm restarting the software as well. Um, but what I was in the middle of saying was that I was about to fly over to Kazakhstan, which is where uh, some of the very first missions were attempted. Oh, I can see that loading bar on my software almost done. Some pretty powerful stuff to fly around in the universe. So it takes a minute for it to load. Um, and I don't know if there are any questions in the comments. I'm looking through real quick just to see if there's anything while we wait the last couple seconds here. <laughs> yeah, connection on Mars is pretty, pretty slow, I guess. All right. Um, ah, there we go. So yes, yeah, so we're going to fly over to Kazakhstan to start out. And for a really, really long time, actually, the first several, several missions that I'm going to talk about, um, were all sent by only two different countries. So the United States and uh, the Soviet Union were the only um, countries for the first couple decades, at least, that were sending missions to Mars. And the first couple in Kazakhstan were in 1960, between 1960 and 1962. And I will open this up in two seconds. There we go. All right, I have to click three more buttons and then we'll be good to go. Okay. Oh, and we're going to start out right above San Francisco. How fun. All right. So here we are <laughs> right above San Francisco and we're going to fly back over to Kazakhstan. What is now Kazakhstan, of course. And I'm going to put on these markers to show us where these missions were attempted. So all the different markers that I'm going to have up are going to show you where these missions were, right? And all the markers that we're going to see to start out with are the big red X markers, meaning, unfortunately, that mission failed. And that shouldn't be too surprising, right? Because if any of these uh, missions started and ended on Earth, clearly weren't successful since they didn't get to Mars. But the first several uh, were over here in Kazakhstan and all failed to launch the first five of these attempted missions. We also tried our hand at this over in Cape Canaveral uh, in Florida, um, here in the United States in 1964, which womp womp also failed to launch on the first try there. We did have our first successful mission though, uh, Mariner 4, which had a successful flyby of Mars in July 1965. So 1965 was the first time we got anything to get close to Mars successfully. And some of these didn't just fail to launch, but they launched a little bit, but then they came back down to Earth, usually kind of crashing in the ocean. And we're gonna fly over to Mars and we will take the same journey that some of these sadly failed missions did as well, because some of them, they, they got pretty far. They got maybe millions and millions of miles away, but then they missed or there was something that went wrong. We lost connection and something I found rather wild about this when I learned about it is that um, these missions, so let's see, uh, Zond 2, Mars 1, Mars 4, they're out there somewhere. They're, they're in the solar system somewhere, uh, going around in space, somewhere around the sun, but uh, we don't really know exactly where they ended up. So some of our robots are just kind of flying around aimlessly throughout the solar system which makes me kind of sad, but also I find kind of funny. Uh, but as you can see, we have a few more showing us the locations around Mars where there were some um, missions that got all the way there, but then they did what we call a hard landing, which means that they essentially crashed into Mars rather than uh, doing their soft landing, which would be a successful landing. 
But even with all of this, we did start to have a, a few successful flybys and a couple successful orbiters. The US and the uh, Soviet Union had a handful of these um, throughout 1964 to 1973. And uh, we, we learned quite a bit from these actually. So I'm gonna turn off the nighttime side of Mars just so we can see the whole thing easily. But some of these bigger features that we're seeing and some of the things that we're uh, really familiar with today this was the time period when we first learned about them. So places like Olympus Mons, which I'm zooming into right here, the largest volcano in our solar system. We got so, the first pictures of that. And also we uh, came to learn about Marineris Valley, which is a gigantic canyon on Mars. So some of these early missions taught us a lot about uh, the surface of Mars that we didn't know before. And kind of dispelled some of those initial ideas that we had too of like, canals and Martians all over the place and cities and things on Mars. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't find any of that. But the first successful lander that we got on Mars was with uh, the United States, the Viking landers. And those also um, were looking into the idea of, okay, so even if there isn't life on Mars now, could there have been life on Mars in the past? And they kind of challenged that idea too it seemed like Mars was kind of a dry, barren place, not a very good place for life. But also with these orbiter missions and such, we started to find lots of evidence of water in the past. And we know that water is really important for life. So that did give us some hope and some uh, motivation to keep going. So, uh, well, first, let me recap real quick. So between 1960 and 1996, about 36 years, we attempted to send about 31 robots to Mars. 10 of those were successful. And all of these attempts, every single one was made by only two places, the United States and the Soviet Union. But now we are entering the golden age of Mars exploration. So between 1996 and 2018, we have sent, uh, so a little over 20 years, we have attempted to send about 23 robots to Mars. And there are way more players in the game now. So we've got uh, folks from the United States, Russia, the European Space Agency, China, Japan, India. And later on, I'll mention um, another one that is brand new as well. I'll mention that at the end of the show. But tons of different people are sending things to Mars. And of those 23, 14 were successful. And eight of those are still in operation today. So that's between 96 and 2018. And throughout all of this, the biggest driving question I would say that we had with all of these different missions is, is there life on Mars or could there be life on Mars? Could there have been life on Mars in the past? So that's kind of our main, a lot of these things is, is there water? Could there have been conditions for life in the past? Because today, if you look at Mars, hmm, this doesn't look very uh, hospitable to me. I don't think I would want to live there uh, very much not seeing a whole lot of things like we see here on earth that would be good for life but with these missions we've learned what we think mars has looked looked like several billion years ago so a few billion years ago we think that mars had a thicker atmosphere we think it had tons of liquid water on its surface and all of this indicates that perhaps this could have had conditions for life in the past so let's really quick visit just a few of the current missions that are going on on Mars right now, and one of which you'll hear a whole lot about later on in the program. But I'm going to fly us down to Curiosity, which is kind of our uh, most successful rover that is there right now. I definitely want to give a huge shout out to Opportunity, which roved on Mars for about 15 years and was super, super successful. It, uh, oh, and I do want to point out too, this little line that you're seeing here is comparing how far Curiosity was like planned to go to have a successful mission and then how far it's actually gone. So it's gone well beyond where we initially planned for it to go in order to consider it to be a successful mission. Um, but yeah, Opportunity was there for 15 years and only had to stop because there was a gigantic dust storm a few years ago that knocked out its power supply for good and it wasn't able to wake back up essentially. So goodbye, little Opportunity. We loved you so much. Um, but the one that's currently there has been there since 2012 is the Curiosity Rover, 
which I'm sure a lot of you are fairly familiar with, have heard of before at least. And it has lots of different tools to explore Mars and see if we can find water and evidence for life. We've got robotic arm, it's got a camera and lasers, and uh, I think of it as kind of a little oven that it has in its belly basically that it can put rocks into and learn what things are made of. And it's uh, been driving around for us for about nine years now and is going strong. And we also have a just a few years ago, um, I don't hear about this one as much just because I think, you know, the rovers are pretty charismatic. They look like cute little moving around robots on the surface of Mars. But there is another uh, lander that was sent to Mars just a few years ago, the InSight lander, which is also currently working and teaching us a lot about Mars that we didn't know before. So InSight is there to study the Marsology. I don't want to say geology because geo, geo is like Earth. So I guess it's like areology, I guess you might want to call it. Um, basically, the tectonic activity and stuff of uh, Mars. So it's trying to see, are there Mars quakes and things like that um, on the surface? Because for a while we thought mm, that Mars probably wouldn't have any earthquakes maybe just because, or Mars quakes, uh, just because of how much smaller it is than Earth and seems less active now and stuff like that. But InSight, I looked it up this morning, just a few days ago on April 1st, um, NASA published an article about how it detected a few strong Mars quakes just recently. So it's finding quite a bit over here. And the lovely star that you're going to hear a lot about, of course, I'm going to fly over real quick to our model of perseverance and ingenuity, which are, are on almost the opposite side of Mars from curiosity. And Curiosity and perseverance are both trying to look for signs of life and signs of water and perseverance, especially they chose the spot that it landed because we think there definitely was this kind of pool or lake of liquid water in the past. And when we first fly up to perseverance, you're going to notice that it's going to look pretty similar to the model that I showed you of curiosity, because at least uh, on the outside, they are extremely similar. They're about the same size same kind of style of rover as well. Oh, look, a little insight. It's, or sorry, not insight, uh, ingenuity over there. Little helicopter, so cute. Um, but you can see it has a robotic arm, has that same kind of swiveling top over here, but it has a lot more um, instruments and some more updated instruments as well to study Mars even further, as well as the capability to collect samples from Mars, which is pretty darn cool. And it brought with it the first ever helicopter that we were going to fly on another planet. So with that really whirlwind thing of kind of run through all the different missions, I do want to switch back to my slides. So let me stop sharing. And then I'm, I'm doing this with fewer tabs this time. So hopefully things won't explode. And I'm going to share a different screen. Do, 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 do. There we go. Just to give a quick rundown of the extremely recent Mar uh, missions that have gone there. And the first of which we just saw was uh, per Perseverance. Let me put this over here. There we go. Um, and I, I discovered this uh, GIF or GIF, depending on who you talk to, uh, when I was uh, prepping for this presentation. And I just thought it was so cool. You can see. That's ingenuity lowering down from Perseverance just a few days ago. But something really exciting is that there's a couple of brand new missions from uh, a couple of countries that haven't sent these types of missions before. So the China National Space Administration just sent their uh, uh, a Tianwen uh, mission and they have their orbiter successfully around Mars. This picture is from the orbiter. And pretty soon, I think maybe summertime or something, they're going to attempt a landing and a an, uh, rover as well on the surface of Mars. And uh, the United Arab Emirates has also sent their first mission to Mars and they have an orbiter named Hope uh, going around as well. So all three of these, Perseverance, uh, Hope, and Tianwen, they have all arrived within the last few months. So it's a very exciting time uh, to be sending things to Mars. All right, so that is the end of my uh, very quick overview of all the different missions 
that we have sent over the years. And I don't know if we have any questions or if we'll leave that till later. Oh, I see Lynn. Hello. Hi, Mary. Hello. Um, we don't have a lot of time just with the technical yeah. difficulties, but I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Well, one first, I know we talked about this right before the program, but can uh -huh. we, can you tell us about your planet stuffies? Yes, so I have a bunch of uh, planet plushes over here and I was pointing out that I do in fact have the Mars one that was sitting right behind me. And it's very cute because it has this little tuft of of hair on the top to represent its polar ice cap. So it has a bunch of ice on the pole there. And you can see, of course, I've put them in order um, from <laughs> the closest to brother. Of course. You can see the sun back there, Mercury. I've got Jupiter and Saturn. I still need the ice giants. I haven't gotten the ice giants yet. So I still need Uranus and Neptune, but I have all the other planets as well as Pluto. Soon then. Um, <laughs> Okay, so a couple of, this one's a quick one. Um, what is the software that you're using and how do you put cute little rovers on it? <laughs> That's a great question. So I'm using Uniview, which is a planetarium software. Um, and it's not one that's like widely available. It's one that's pretty much if you, you need to work in a planetarium or have a planetarium to uh, use it. Um, but the models that we use um, are often developed by in-house um, by our coworker, Dan Tell, he makes a lot of those and they're based directly on uh, the data that he gets from NASA and from um, the different uh, space agencies and stuff that make these. So they're very accurate in terms of what you see and they're very adorable, I think as well. <laughs> um, and then time for one last question. Um, would the Chinese and UAE orbiters possibly crash into each other or do they coordinate where they are orbiting around Mars? Hmm, that's a good question. I would. I would like to say I should definitely assume that they coordinate. I would say it's very, very likely to coordinate. I'm sure they do coordinate. It's just, you know, sometimes weird stuff happens and people don't coordinate and then things do crash into each other. But I would have to guess uh, with no research whatsoever that yes, they did coordinate with each other and they put them into orbit in a way that they won't ever crash into yeah. each other. <laughs> I would hope so too. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much, Mary. And thanks for sticking through our technical yeah. difficulties. Sorry, Sorry we didn't have that. more time for That's a Q&A, cool um, but I'm sure we'll bring you back another time. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, up next, we have Dr. Vandy Verma. Hi, uh, so I'm, uh, I, can you see my slides? There we go. Uh, so I'm Vandy Verma. I, um, I'm uh, the chief engineer of Perseverance Robotic Operations, and I also work on operating uh, Perseverance. And previously I've worked on Curiosity, Opportunity, and Spirit. And uh, right now we're very excited about Ingenuity as well. So I'm going to, let, let's see if I can get the slides to move. So um, if you see this, uh, so these are the locations where uh, all the locations where we've had successful missions that have landed on Mars. I was actually going to use examples from missions that I've personally been involved with uh, to talk about some of the examples of how we explore Mars uh, with robots. So that's particularly the area that I work in and I'm interested in. And here you're seeing a picture from the JPL, the NASA JPL Mars Yard. There on the left, right in the front, you can see the smallest rover that is Sojourner. That was the first rover we ever sent to Mars. And right next to Sojourner on the far left is a picture of uh, the Mer rover. So that's what Spirit and Opportunity look like. So these are Earth replicas, and we use them to test in our Mars Yard. And in the middle on the left image, uh, the the rover there, that is Curiosity. So that, that's a full-scale model of the Curiosity rover. And then on the far right, at the bottom there, that is a replica of Perseverance. Right now, we are still working on putting all the parts together for the Earth test bed. So it does have a robotic arm. I don't, we don't have a public image of the robotic arm yet, but it doesn't have the sampling mechanism on it just yet. But at the bottom, you're seeing a full-scale model of ingenuity as well to just get a sense of the scale of the rover with respect uh, to the helicopter uh, on Earth. 
So Perseverance uh, landed on Mars on February 18th of 2021. Uh, so it was a very exciting day. You can see me there on the left the middle um, holding my lucky peanuts in mission control. So I'm really not as much part of entry, descent and landing, but I was on the rover operation side. Once we land, we immediately hand over to the rover side. And if we actually had to do something dramatic, uh, if I had actually got to do something, we would, like I like to joke, we would have been going Apollo 13. Things went very nominally. So luckily we didn't have a whole ton to do that day. Uh, and you can see there was a lot of excitement. That teardrop on the top left shows the area we were targeting in Jezero Crater. That's the location we, are going, we were going to. And Jezero isn't, you know, the image on the right, if you see the image on the right, it shows it's a delta and it's an ancient level, river delta. And we're going, going there to look for signs of ancient life. And a delta is a fantastic place for that. So that's the reason why that was very interesting to us. And the middle there is that picture uh, was taken with cameras on Mars as we were landing. This is this when this image came down that day, the first day we were all there. It was just so amazing because we had landed Curiosity in much the same way with the sky crane maneuver, which you're seeing on the top right. But this was the first time we actually had cameras, so we could see what happened rather than just have data and telemetry to tell us that. And on the bottom right, you'll see just how spread out things get. On the bottom right is an image of the rover where it landed. And then you can also see the heat shield in the sky crane, because once the sky crane drops the rover on the umbilical, it has to fly off and crash so it doesn't crash on top of uh, the robot. Uh, so after that, we've been continuing to do our checkouts. And this is showing some of the Perseverance uh, robotic operations. We really have spent so much time, six months cruising to Mars, and then this dramatic launch with all the dynamics that you have and also uh, the landing. And we wanted to make sure everything works as expected. So on the top left, you're seeing a movie. I think it should be an animation, but maybe there of the first time, first robotic activity we did actually, which was stowing, unstowing the robotic arm. And this is a pretty enormous robotic arm. It's 2.1 meters long. And it's uh, got a 45 kilogram turret at the end of it with a lot of tools. Uh, on the bottom left is a picture of me there on the day we did that on Stow uh, in robotic operations. And in the middle, you're seeing a picture of the very first drive we did. And uh, I'm, I'm, I really like these drives because you literally have tracks that appear as if they start from nowhere because the rover did come right from the sky and it's got these tracks. So that was the very first drive. And on the bottom, in the middle, I'm showing a picture of uh, rover drivers, we use 3D goggles because we are trying to get a sense of the terrain on Mars that no human has ever been in and we have to drive a robot in it. So we use the 3D goggles to give a very immersive experience of what it is like to drive there. And on the top right, I'm showing a picture of the very first time, you know, we were taking, we were inspecting our turret, rotating it, taking images. But there's a lot of people behind all of this. You see the rover, you see the pictures and things happening, but they are the hundreds of scientists and engineers who built the hardware, who thought of all the science we're going to do. And on the bottom right, I'm showing a picture of all of the members of the uh, algorithms and software development for the robotic arm and the sample caching uh, flight software. Because of how far Mars is, you know, it takes a lot of time for light to travel between Earth and Mars. So we can't control the rovers in real time. If you were to send a command and wait, it would could take anywhere from four to 24 minutes for the rover to even get the command. And then an, as much time for that, for us to hear back and know how it went. So there's no way, you know, we could be on some precipice and tell it to hit the brakes and have that work. So that's not how we drive. Uh, we, this time delay really changes how we have to operate the rover on Mars. Uh, we actually, use three of the deep space network antennas. There's one in Australia and Canberra, one in the US in Goldstone, and one in Madrid in Spain. We send commands from uh, mission control through the deep space network to the rover uh, because there's a smaller set of data when you're sending commands. But when the rover takes the data, it's got enormous amount of data, a lot of imagery. So we actually take that and uplink it to orbiters around Mars, which 
have a lot more power uh, because uh, you know they and they have a better view of Earth, and so that then they communicate with the deep space network and send us the commands back, uh, send us the data back. So tactical rover planning, as we call it, consists of on the left top you'll see we get the data down to say what happened yesterday because we are not a lot of the orbital missions you plan well ahead of time what's going to happen in an entire orbit, but when you're on Mars on the surface, there's very little information about what you're going to find the next day. We respond every day to what we see the previous day. And so you're seeing here on the top left a picture of us of, of the downlink analysis. Now, this is from Curiosity. Uh, we don't, I don't uh, have a publicly released one from the Perseverance one. It's much the same, except more very socially distanced with everybody uh, separated. Our entire facility was redone for operations. And on the middle there, you're seeing the science team. Once the data comes down, there's an engineering discussion going on and analysis, but the science team is discussing what is it that we discovered? What do we want to do next based on what we found? Um, this entire team, which consists of you know, four to 500 scientists from all over the world is remote for perseverance because of the pandemic, uh, but they all log in uh, still and uh, have a discussion uh, to decide what we're going to do. And then on the bottom left, you're seeing an image. That one's actually from Perseverance. The masks will give that away. Where we're, uh, and we're very socially distanced now, uh, where we are uh, driving the rovers and operating the rovers. Once that happens, we go through and send the commands. On the right, I'm showing some of our tools and how we do this driving. So there's a picture we've gotten actually from Mars. That's a stereo image that contains three-dimensional data. And on that, we lay tracks to decide how are we gonna navigate this terrain? Uh, the little uh, you know, square boxes and uh, the oval you're seeing here was because this particular drive, this was one of the drives that I did, was us trying to get to the airfield. This was the site we had selected to deploy Ingenuity. And this area here is the helipad, this is the airfield and the large areas, the flight zone. And we were driving uh, to that deployment. So where's Perseverance now? Uh, we've been driving around, mainly to do all our deployments. In the middle there, you see the flat uh, object, that is a belly pan. It was protecting the adaptive caching assembly, which contains hardware, which is going to collect samples that we're gonna bring back to Earth, and then debris shield. And then, uh, you know, we, we've driven to the helicopter location and deployed the helicopter. This was a very, very interesting dive, drive uh, because Ingenuity was suspended under our rover we had to drive off, deploy it and drive off. But if that drive failed, the helicopter could have died because it, we needed to sh unshade its solar panels. While it was attached to Perseverance, it was charging from Perseverance. But once we deployed it, it had to have its solar panels exposed. So we worked a lot to make this drive such that even in the case we had certain faults, we would have still managed them. So this was uh, a very interesting uh, drive to do. Uh, and I got to do that one on Mars, which was very exciting. So the next, another thing we've done before, we've taken a rover helicopter selfie, and this was one an activity that I uh, led doing. How do we take these selfies? If you see the arm here in the front, you don't see it, because actually there's no third entity other than the rover and helicopter on Mars. So we're actually using the robotic arm to move it around and take uh, these images. They are 66 images with a camera on the robotic arm, 62 actually, taken to stitch together uh, to create this mosaic. Uh, and so then we're getting ready to fly the Ingenuity helicopter. And there's going to be a number of, um, first we're just gonna take off and land, and that is happening uh, this weekend. And we're very excited, Sunday night, um, midnight Sunday, all of us are gonna be there in Mission Control waiting for the data to come back. And actually it's gonna be live streamed and all of you can share that and I'll provide that information in the end. Now what happens after we've done these amazing flights? You know, we, we're gonna have a series of flights which demonstrate the first powered flight on a, a Mars. Uh, we, we actually have an entire science mission. Uh, Perseverance has a suite of instruments. Uh, and we are there to study the geology, astrobiology, and actually collect sample tubes and pave the way for astronauts because we actually are going to synthesize in situ oxygen to demonstrate that. But the sample tubes that we're collecting, we're going to cache them from a leg of a third, you know, multi-year mission to bring back to Earth. And that'll, that'll be the first time that we've ever brought back samples from Mars to Earth. And that allows us to use 
all the laboratories available on earth to analyze them. So scientists are just extremely excited uh, for us to do that. And so we're gonna carry on exploring Jezero Crater. And uh, on the left, you're seeing the Delta where we landed. And on the right, uh, right top, you're seeing some of the path. We wanna get onto the Delta because we think that's where uh, past signs of life are likely to be. We're gonna climb out and then we're gonna climb out of the crater and beyond. And on the bottom, I'm showing a picture just to show the scale of the rover relative to the walls of the Delta. It, it is very enormous. And so, you know, uh, in the interest of time, I might not go into too much of this, but I, I can go over it uh, later if there are questions. There's a lot of things that happen along the drives uh, that uh, are going to be very interesting. This is a picture from Curiosity. And while we were driving, soon after we landed, we discovered that um, we're going to Mars because it surprises us, surprised us that the rocks the, were ventifax, very sharp, and they were tearing our wheels. So we had to get across to better terrain. But in order to do that, we had to cross this dune. And uh, we have built in technology on the rovers from driving previous rovers, where we know that if we drive over a dune when we slip, our diometer can tell us that we're driving forward, but we're actually digging deeper. So we, uh, we use computer vision where we take a picture and we move our wheels. And then if this rock hasn't moved behind, it was here, and if it hasn't moved behind, we know we haven't moved. So we use these techniques and uh, in this case, Curiosity was very um, uh, safely able to make it into Moonlight Valley and it's still continuing the mission. We've redesigned the wheels in various ways uh, to improve uh, and reduce the chances of the terror we were seeing. And another example I wanted to show you and just a few examples of the sorts of things we encounter and uh, just snippets of technology, there's tons of this, is on Maria's Pass on Curiosity. You know, we drove up to this uh, hill and we were looking at this view and the scientists were terribly excited because contacts are very interesting because contacts tell you something about uh, you know, geology and potential astrobiology. And here was the contact between the Simpson and Murray formation. But Mars is an interesting place. There's a time when uh, the sun comes between Earth and Mars. And we call that conjunction. We can't talk to the spacecraft for some time. So conjunction was coming and they really wanted to get to the other side and take you know, some data so they could study it over conjunction. And we did make it, and this is from Missoula, which was, you know, we took a mosaic there and this shows the drive we went across. But while we were in conjunction and got the data down, this very benign looking rock on the left, elk, which just looks like any other rock. When we saw it on the right, you're seeing a tele, telescopic image from our super you know from our chem cam instrument a version of which we also have on perseverance uh, improved called supercam but it can take this image at higher resolution and shoots a laser and study uh, the vapor from it that it had very interesting characteristics so interesting that they actually wanted to go all the way back so we drove back and we found that it had really high amounts of silica which is a which which you know signifies that there was water there. And this is a picture of a different type of selfie that we took at the buckskin target where we drilled there. So this shows that as we are driving, we're covering a lot of distance, but there are things we could miss. So we have a lot of autonomy on board where the rover itself can take a picture, which is on the left. And then in that picture, it can find what are interesting things there. A lot of it could be just sand, but it finds these interesting rocks. It'll prioritize them based on things we told it we are interested in. Filter things, like we said, don't, we're not interested here in small rocks. So it said, well, let's get rid of the small rocks. Very interested in uh, rocks that are of certain size of a certain albedo. And then it'll shoot the laser at those rocks, take the data and continue driving along. So that's the kind of autonomy we'll build on board so that in that one uplink pass we do between Earth and Mars, we can get a lot of science done. Uh, so this shows uh, where we're trying to shoot a very fine instrument. We need milliradian level accuracy. So we also use computer vision techniques once we've detected that target to use an image around it to visually correct for it. Uh, and this this is just some of the examples and there are numerous such examples. And this was one that I worked on. So that's why I'm giving you examples of things. Uh, but there's a number of others uh, that are very similar that um, allow us to do a lot of science autonomously. So uh, this is a picture of how Aegis, which is this technology, and uh, I worked on it for both Curiosity and Perseverance, 
it automatically on board detected these rocks. And you can see in the image, uh, there's mostly soil, but it was able to find some of the most interesting rocks and uh, take data on them. And the green one shows the one that it actually targeted uh, with the laser. Uh, so with that, um, you know, I will end here so you can, uh, uh, we can have some questions. And I also put a link there right at the bottom there of the Mars helicopter watch online, which, which is going to live stream our first flight on Mars with Ingenuity helicopter. Awesome, thanks so much, Vandy. Um, we'll drop that link for everybody in the comments and chat um, in a, a little bit when we're, when we're done with Q and A. Um, that was so fun to see all that. Um, so quick question, I know you mentioned when we were talking that you're, you're off, you're between shifts right now. And so some people, somebody asked, um, does the robotic operations team schedule their daily schedule by Martian souls or does the rover tend to operate on Earth time? Or does this uh, repeat the last part of it or does the rover tend um, to operate on Earth? Or or, so yeah, do you schedule your shifts and the, um, the rover operations based on Martian souls or by Earth time? Uh, absolutely on Mars time for the first mm -hmm. uh, three months. So I'm currently living on Mars time. So we, <laughs> Uh, who work the operations team, we work what we call the Martian night shift. So every day when it's 6 p.m. on Mars, we go into work and we build the plan for what the rover will do the next day. And we work the whole night so that by the time it's daylight on Mars, the rover has a plan for what it needs to do and it goes about doing it. Now, what gets interesting is the Mars day is 40 minutes approximately longer than an Earth day. So uh, last shift I had, I went into work at 7 p.m. And you know, I'd come <laughs> home in the morning. Uh, next one, you go into work at uh, 7.40, and then that carries on. So we rotate around Earth time, but we're actually working the same time on Mars time. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think people were super fascinated, I was, by, by the autonomous, um, learning by the how rover could detect rocks so how do you kind of prioritize what rock to focus on or spend time analyzing and like how do you analyze a rock that's on mars <laughs> it gets it, you know that's one of the things that's so interesting because every place we get to after a drive is so interesting that i almost feel that the science team could make a lander out of our rover and spend the entire mission just studying one site because <laughs> there really is so much you can find but the way the technology that uh, onboard autonomy uh, which we call ages detects the rocks is we have algorithms which help us identify what size shape rocks we're interested in but we really mm -hmm. let the science team decide because if we're in a particular location and we are interested in bedrock, we can tune the variables to say that is what we're interested in. We can change it if we are in a terrain where actually what's very interesting are soil targets. So that is entirely determined what, based on what humans want. Of course, we have to pre-think of what will be interesting to us in this particular terrain. And so we think about uh, what we're interested in and It'll, it'll automatically find similar features to that on board. And it uses uh, you know, uh, some AI and machine learning techniques to do mm -hmm. that. Uh, but the, if it finds a number of rocks that meet the criteria, we can also prioritize things. We can say, if you find, we can find, for example, up to 255 targets, uh, and we wanna mm -hmm. shoot just one. We can say, out of all of the ones you find, pick the one that has the most ruggedness or the most, you know, eccentricity, yeah. things like that. And is perseverance a good student? Uh, perseverance <laughs> is, you know, the, uh, definitely has a mind, uh, the rovers have a mind of their own, I like to say, but uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, perseverance has been doing very well on Mars. It's been, uh, you know, everything has been going really well. It's been very interesting. Great. Um, and then, I think people are really interested in, you know, how this rover is going to get up that giant, uh, the delta, I think, or the crater. Um, so, are have you identified some reasonable routes that might get it up and over? Yes, 
right literally you know so what's interesting is you watch entry descent and landing and we have mm. a landing ellipse so we don't know where we're going to land in a about in, for perseverance it was really relatively smaller than previous missions because our entry descent technology is also getting much more sophisticated so it was about you know seven kilometer radius but once you know where you are you're plotting that path to where you want to go from that mm -hmm. instance so we have been planning and there are many options because from where we landed we could go eastward we could go westward and the science team has a lot of debates and discussions and they're very interesting it's like presentations they make which are like entire theses about why we should <laughs> pick a particular path because if yeah. you pick an alternate path there are things we won't see versus others now in terms of how we'll get onto the delta we have identified locations where the slopes are less steep so that'll be our entry point to get onto it and once we're on it we can get to different access points so we we analyze the terrain a lot for those kinds of um access where we can get on great and um i think we have time for one more question um have there been any thoughts of building a rover that can drop off smaller science stations at some really interesting spots to do more in-depth studies that's a, that's a great idea. And yes, uh, they have been, you know, in some ways, ingenuity is that, although it is mm -hmm. a helicopter, but we are drop, we dropped off ingenuity and it's going to be in the airfield. And yes, uh, we drove off from ingenuity yesterday. We are 40 meters away from ingenuity right now. And, and as we speak, actually, we're planning the next drive. Yeah. That helicopter is going to do flights, but it's going to, you know, stay there in some ways that we can certainly deploy instruments. The challenge becomes that the most costly in terms of energy and you know resources is sending something to Mars. Once you send it there, if you carry it from place to place, and that's what's powerful about a rover, you can study many different types of sites. So there is some value potentially in leaving it in a spot, but there, the argument towards carrying it with you so far for the resources that you don't invest in it have to outweigh that. And uh, typically going to multiple sites is more valuable. Mm -hmm. um, I just have one more just personal question for you. What has been your, like the favorite thing you've seen, your personal favorite thing you've seen come back from the rover on this mission? On Perseverance? Yeah, that is such a tough question because every day, you know, you look at something and you're like, wow, you know, just um, that is such a tough question. I have to say, you know, because we spent so much time working on that rover a selfie and there was um, <laughs> there is a particular animation of it and things. I think that's been really great because it captures both the helicopter and the rover in the one spot. And uh, yeah. I think that was really neat. And that just came down a couple of days ago. So that's been great, but it's hard to pick. <laughs> I know. I saw that earlier today. It's very cute. Everyone should go find the little selfie. Um, well, thank you so much, Bandy, for being with us tonight. Um, and and good luck with the continuing, continuing mission. Well, thanks so much. And uh, thanks for the interest. Yeah. Good night. All right. Up next, um, we have Dorsa Shirazi and Winnie Quang, who will talk about a little more in depth about the depth about the development of the helicopter. And I'm here with my coworkers, Winnie Quang. We are really excited to talk with you about Ingenuity, the first atom of the power control on Mars. As Maria and Wendy were pointing out, um, Perseverance and Ingenuity start their travel to Mars back in 2020, at July 30th. And Ingenuity was in hold in the belly of the rover as a secondary payload. And on February 8th, when they landed, we had the first communication with Ingenuity uh, when they confirmed that um, actually it can charge the um, Mars helicopter. So we're really happy. That was a really exciting day for us. But we still we had to wait for the suitable condition um, to deploy the helicopter. So uh, what it happened was on March 21st, the protective shield released. And as you see in the picture on the right, 
Um, that's the uh, picture that uh, Rover took. But on April 4th, which was recently, um, Ingenuity got deployed on the Martian soil. And I should mention, Ingenuity went to Mars as a pure experimental flight test. So there is no requirement for it to take any data or collect any sample like the rover had to do. Uh, Mars helicopter is going to be the first atom of power control on another planet. And that's really huge. And we are all really excited for it. And um, the lesson that we're going to learn um, with Ingenuity, we're going to use it for future mission on Mars. But uh, I guess many of you have that question, like why we had, um, why do we need the helicopter on Mars? Before we were using satellites and with satellites, we were able to take um, images of the whole landscape and see what is there, but we were missing some details. And the rover was able to take pictures of the closer uh, points, but it's similar to like sitting on the inside of your car and you cannot see what's down the road. And having a helicopter can fill out the gap between these two technology. Um, and that was one of the reasons that we wanted to create ingenuity. The other advantage of having a helicopter on Mars is um, Mars helicopter can travel faster. Just to give you a uh, example, the map that you see on the left, it shows a distance that Curiosity rover was traveling um, less than five years that can be traveled in three days by Mars helicopter. So definitely there is advantage there, but uh, it's definitely challenging too. Mars is not like Earth. There is many things different, like the whole atmosphere, um, all the condition there is um, different. For example, gravity. The gravity of Mars is one third of Earth. And uh, the density of air is one person of what we have on Earth, which is basically the air is so thin that the whole plate had to turn so fast to be able to lift the whole um, body of the helicopter. Also, the temperature at Mars is really cold, especially at night, it gets even to negative 90 Celsius. Um, and surviving that harsh environment and all the electronics, just to make sure that's not freezing, that's a challenge. The other challenge that we had, as Wendy also mentioned, it's the delay that we have between um, sending a signal from Earth to Mars and back. So the Mars helicopter had autonomously be able to navigate itself, uh, which makes it exciting and challenging at the same time. Um, even though the all the signals are traveling in the uh, speed of light, but since it had to go from the satellite to another satellite, it's gonna take around like five to 20 minutes to get to either side. So that was definitely challenging. Um, and this project, many engineers and intern work, and they came up with the design that we have today. Um, the picture that you see on the left, I'm pretty sure you've probably seen it many times. Um, this is, Ingenuity Mars helicopter, which weighed around four pounds. The design is very compact, lightweight, um, just to make it suitable for packaging and making sure that for the entering descent and landing, um, it's suitable for that condition as well. The rotor design is the coaxial counter rotating blade. Basically, it's two rotors stacked on top of another, and each of them gonna turn different direction. Um, to give you an example and compare it with the helicopter that we usually see on Earth, um, Earth um, the picture that you see on the right, uh, that's US-60, and it has a main rotor on the top, and it had a smaller rotor uh, on the tail, which we call it anti-torque. Um, we have it to make sure that the whole helicopter wouldn't start turning around itself. And same thing with the coaxial design for Mars helicopter. Um, having two of the blades turning opposite of direction of each other can, gonna cancel out that rotating gyroscopic move basically. Um, and also it allows us to have a compact design. The rotor diameter is around four feet and it's made of the carbon fibers, make it really light. Um, the blade has to turn really fast around 2,400 RPM, which is comparing to like, for example, your 60 that in average turns 258 RPM, it's pretty fast. Um, and that's just, again, um, because of the density of the um, area. Mars is so um, 
load that we have to um, rotate the all the blade that fast. Um, the helicopter will control by changing the blade pitch and collective and cyclic uh, for each rotor separately. But let's look at the each part of the rover. From the top, we have the solar panel, and that's how the Mars helicopter is able to charge itself. Underneath, you see the antenna, and um, that's how the um, radial signal from the Ingenuity rover and Earth um, and communication is happening. We have the blade made of carbon fiber, same thing as landing gear, the legs, both of them are made of carbon fiber. Um, in the middle, we have the body, uh, we have a, a programmable, um, thermostat or heater um, just to make sure that all the electronics would then freeze in the harsh condition of Mars. And also we have the brain of the uh, robots, we have two cameras, um, there is a laser altimeter to measure the altitude above the fixed uh, level, we have a IMU or initial measurement units um, that can identify the position, speed and also acceleration. Um, of the helicopter. There is a inclinometer um, sensor as well to measure the angle, slope, and elevation. Um, some of the sensors that I mentioned, actually they are um, off the shelf component. So it makes it really interesting. Um, these are the same sensors, some of them are same sensors that you have on your smart um, cell phones. Um, and I think that makes it even more interesting. So when um, the first flight gonna happen, which is gonna happen really soon, um, in June, we're gonna have five flights over 30 souls. A range of each flight gonna be about uh, 300 meters, uh, which takes around 90 seconds. After each flight, it's gonna land, charge itself, and it's gonna use the telecommunication system that it has um, to send the images and flight information to the rover and Earth. And after that, from Earth, we're gonna get the flight instruction uh, for the next day. After the first flight, uh, there will be an increase in difficulty of flight. And all of us are really excited to see the first flight of Mars. So by that being said, I'd like um, to uh, give it next to my coworker, Winnie, uh, who's gonna talk about the helicopter in, uh, Ingenuity journey. Thanks, Dursa. So, as Dursa said, uh, we're so excited for this upcoming flight. And, you know, to take a concept to something that will be flying on Mars, it was really an extensive collaborative effort between multiple or among multiple NASA centers. And this was done in a matter of six years. Now, Dorsa and I are part of the aeromechanics branch, and we're, we do a lot of study in rotorcraft, the airfoil design, and such. And here is a timeline of the efforts at the aeromechanics branch. You can see that it's a combination of experiments and simulation because they serve as benchmarks for one another. You can see that there are rotor testing uh, in Martian atmospheric conditions to determine how it'll behave. And there is computational fluid dynamic testing of the airfoils. So when we're doing something as novel as flying on Mars, we really want to design the facilities to be able to simulate those Martian conditions and test our rotors in those environmental conditions. So that is also part of the timeline. But towards the right of the timeline is something that is even more exciting. So if Ingenuity is successful in its flight demonstration tests, then that would open a lot of potential for future Mars rotorcraft missions, where we have uh, more rotorcraft that could aid in uh, rovers and future Mars exploration. So on the right side is um, some conceptual models of successors to Ingenuity. And the successors will be capable of scientific missions unlike Ingenuity. So it will be larger in size, potentially have larger rotor diameters uh, and also larger size in general to accommodate a, a payload, a scientific payload. 
And with getting anything on Mars, we have to consider the entry, descent, and landing systems. So we have looked at how these conceptual models can fold so that they can fit inside existing entry, descent, and landing systems. So this was one of the experiments from the timeline. This was done at Ames. This is the first ever surrogate rotor testing in forward flight. And this was done in the wind tunnel in the Planet Aeolian Laboratory at Ames. And this was so exciting. Uh, we learned a lot from the study, but more importantly, this study really motivated us to look into how we might design our facilities so that we can have more efficient ways to test rotors. So whenever you're running a rotor in an enclosure, you have a lot of uh, wake generated. And we wanted to determine whether this wake would interfere with rotor measurement performance. So this motivated more study um, done at Ames and also at JPL. So I previously showed the experiment for rotors and now this is experiment on the flight of Mars helicopter prototypes. So the first one is in December, 2014. And this was just to show whether we can achieve flight in Mars atmospheric conditions. Now, as Dorsa mentioned, Mars atmospheric density is a lot thinner than Earth, it's approximately 1%. And you can see over here that this prototype is struggling to fly. As soon as it lifts, it, it falls back down. So this prototype over here is open loop control, which is inherently unstable. And since it's struggling so much, um, this really motivated us to do more research to design a control system that's closed loop um, that really addresses all the instabilities that come with such a low atmospheric density. And we, we did a series of experiments called system identifications to identify the aerodynamic characteristics and the parameters. And from the, that experiment, we were able to uh, create a control system to implement on this prototype right over here. So this prototype has a rotor that is pretty much the same as Ingenuity's. Um, you can also see that there is a cable attached to this prototype. Much of the avionics in this prototype is offloaded. And there is also a cable on top to replicate the gravity on Mars. There are also spheres, uh, white spheres on the top, and that it is to serve as visual motion tracker targets. So, you know, on Earth, uh, it's it's very normal for any aircraft to hover like that. But you got to keep in mind that this is done in JPL's 25 foot space simulator. And this is done in Martian atmospheric conditions. So it was a huge milestone and a very exciting moment for all of us. And right now it's it's slowing down. But the whole Mars helicopter program is really a high risk and high reward. We want to do everything that we can to ensure that ingenuity is able to fly on Mars. So this is another flight test, which is done more recently in January 2018. And as Dorsa mentioned, Ingenuity will perform five sets of flight tests over a span of dirty Martian days. And these flight tests will be in increasing difficulty. So the first flight test is a simple hover test. It's uh, hovering 12 foot into the air. Um, but the success of Mars flight test will be increasing difficulty involving the helicopter transversing to the side and then transversing back and then lowering and such. And this is just one of the examples. Um, notice over here that it says that it climbed one meter, uh, but in the actual flight, it's, it's gonna climb at a higher altitude. This is just a demonstration. But still this was super exciting that it was able to perform this maneuver. So we're all waiting 
for that day when Ingenuity is finally able to fly. And it is so exciting, but also very nerve wracking. Like is, is, will it fly? But regardless of whether it is able to fly or not, the Mars helicopter program and the whole project is already a winner. We have learned a tremendous amount of knowledge from getting this concept to something that is functioning and now on Mars and being able to fly this on Earth in Mars-like conditions. Um, you know, if, it, if Ingenuity is successful, it will be the first powered flight on another planet. And in many ways, Ingenuity's milestones that it is set to achieve will parallel a lot of the Wright brothers' accomplishments. So on the first day, the Wright brothers achieved a flight at an altitude of 12 feet. And that is what Ingenuity will set as its milestone on the first day. And on the fourth day, the Wright brothers flew a range of 300 meters. And that is also the same milestone that Ingenuity set for itself on the fourth day. So we are so excited. And if Ingenuity is able to perform all of its flight tests with no problem, this would open a lot of doors for what science can be done. So we're, we're just really excited. Thank you so much for listening. And now we're gonna open this up to questions for the audience. Hi, Winnie and Dorsa. Hi. Hi. That was really cool. I like all the flight demo videos. Uh, we have time for some questions. So first one is how, I know you kind of referenced the size of Ingenuity, but can you elaborate more on how big is Ingenuity and how much does it weigh? Yes, um, it's weighed around four pounds and the whole blade is um, around two feet in di diameter. So it's quite big, but it's not like the helicopter that we see on Earth. It's not that big, yeah. um, but the size of it and the weight of it, it had to be small uh, because of the, it had to fit and get packed underneath the rover. So because of that, there was a limitation on the weight and size for us. And that made it a challenging design too, and interesting. Yeah, so if if you lift up your laptop, that's roughly around four pounds. And uh, like the rotor, each of the rotor blades are two feet. So four feet in diameter, um, yeah. I'm just gonna lift mine up now. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Uh, how is Ingenuity um, controlled? Does it does it guide itself after being given basic instructions? Um, just how does it? Yeah. How is it guided? Um, so Ingenuity is given flight trajectories planned on Earth, and uh, it follows these flight trajectories. Uh, but in terms of control, Dorsa talked about, uh, you know, it's swashplate design. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is different helicopter movement, in, you know, roll, pitch, yaw, and also heaving. Um, that is done through a combination of the cyclic and collective controls. Cool. Uh, next question is, does Ingenuity communicate to Earth through perseverance, through MRO, or directly back to Earth with its own transmitter, et cetera? It's communicated through the station that Rover has, and from there to the Earth. And same thing for sending the information, images, and like uh, flight data that is collected for the, um, through the flight that it has. And also through that, it's gonna receive the, all the flight in instruction for the next day. Uh, are there any winds on Mars that could cause problems? So um, when we designed Ingenuity, uh, we set a limit to, you know, at what wind speed uh, it will not fly. Um, so it can handle up to 10 uh, meter per second uh, wind speeds. And then time for one last question. Are you working on designing the next copter if Ingenuity goes well? Yeah, so we are working on designing the next copter. Um, you know, the design is still something that we're we're still playing around with and exploring different configurations. Uh, but you know, it, since it has a science mission, we're looking at a larger size, and it has payloads uh, that you know are are larger than the current 
payload that we have right now on Ingenuity. Absolutely, and also for the rotor, we are making it more optimized, and right now they are working on that. Very cool. Thank you so much, Dorsa and Winnie, and good luck with Ingenuity. It's very exciting to just hear all of this and see what happens in the next couple of days. Thank, Thank, you, for Thank you for having us. Um, up next, we have Jason Achilles. Hello, everybody. All right. Um, I guess, uh, OK, good. We got the slide going here. Uh, yeah, these have been uh, amazing presentations. Um, I'm just very uh, honored to be here with everybody. And uh, it's a really exciting time to be all, all this stuff happening in space right now. It's really incredible. So um, uh, I guess let me um, just give a very quick background by myself and then we'll we'll get to the fun stuff. Um, that is actually me in that spacesuit. <laughs> a friend of mine calls this the space roadie photo. And um, I am a professional musician by trade. That's what I studied, went to school for, spend my time doing. Um, and if you look closely at my t-shirt there, you can also see where my planetary alliances lie. Uh, Pluto, never forget. Just saying. Um, and uh, let's see, this is a quick shot of my studio. There is some irony here in that uh, in working to develop sound on Mars, I'm actually somebody who in my professional life tends to work with equipment that's about 30 years old. <laughs> if you look close at that photo, there's there's not very, there's not a lot of modern technology in there, um, but you know. And, uh, oh yeah, well, there you go. That's a show, I don't know, rock and roll. Okay, onto the good stuff. Um, sound on Mars. Um, so I guess the first question is, you know, why do we care? Why, do, why, do, why, are, why are we interested in trying to capture sound on Mars? Is it even possible to capture sound on Mars? Well, um, as, as we've probably all heard by now, it is possible and it worked. Uh, thank God it worked. Um, the, uh, the atmosphere on Mars is, uh, well, so it's interesting that the problems we have with trying to capture sound are similar to um, the problems that we have in capturing, that the helicopters had to, you know, um, tackle in that there's such a slim atmosphere. It's a, around 1%, maybe a little less, I think. Um, and just as that affects your ability to, uh, you know, fly through the air because you have nothing to hold on to, uh, the, the, the atmosphere is very thin. And so it's, uh, it affects how sound travels through it. It does actually work. And as we've heard, um, but there are some effects and most notably is that it falls off quickly with distance. Um, the advantage we have in this situation is that most of everything you're going to hear on Mars, if you are, if you are a rover, is very similar to what you would hear if you were walking through Death Valley or driving through, you know, the middle of the desert. Um, basically, most everything you hear is the sounds you produce. So those sounds don't actually have to travel very far. Um, you know, you're hearing your own footsteps or your, your wheels grinding, uh, or maybe your drill, you know, um, or in the case of the super cam instrument, you can hear, uh, they, they have a laser that zaps at rocks and, uh, analyzing the popping sound that that makes, they're able to, uh, help make deductions about the, I think it's the chemical composition. I, I don't work on that system, but, uh, it, it helps inform the science team about the composition of the rock that they're hitting with this laser. Um, so if you look at, uh, uh, oh, yeah, so very quickly, I'm sorry, I'm a musician, and uh, in 2016, I was sitting around with uh, my friend Joseph Karsten, who um, uh, works, uh, he's one of the drivers of the uh, Curiosity rover, and now um, Perseverance, and uh, we were talking about whether or not audio had ever been captured, and it turned out it hadn't, and um, basically, when I found out this uh, this program was going to move forward. I, I wrote JPL and asked if I could be involved and they needed somebody. And the, so that's how I got involved. Um, now, if you look at this photo, there's uh, two blue circles on there. Uh, and those sorry, there's two different microphones actually on the Rover. Um, the one with the arrow is uh, not surprisingly the one I worked on. And that is part of the entry, descent and landing camera system, the EDL cam system. 
So if you guys, most of you probably saw the uh, incredible landing sequence when this thing came down and they had all this video, this microphone was tied in with that system. And uh, we'll get back to that in a minute because you probably noticed that we never heard that and I'll explain why in a bit. Um, but the other microphone is uh, on the top of the mast there, and that's part of an instrument called SuperCam. I was not involved in this. These are entirely different systems, and they're in different kind of microphones as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I worked on the little one that's on the side there. It's about where your door handle would be on the driver's side of your car. Uh, if you imagine that, you know, the Rover's about, you know, it's about the size of a, of a car. It's a, it's a big piece of equipment here. Um, so anyway, I got hired. Uh, I had to start my own company, um, which uh, my friend Joseph came up with. That means absolutely nothing, but we thought it had a, I thought it had a kind of nice Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sort of sound to it. And uh, we got to work. So uh, that's me uh, on the left. In the middle is our supervisor, David Gruel, who, uh, if you guys saw the, um, the press conference, uh, when the first audio from Mars was released, that was Dave. You probably didn't recognize him because he was wearing a mask, uh, but that was him showing the microphone. And when we heard that first little gust of wind that came through on Soul 2, and to his right in the photo is Cesar Garcia, who might be uh, joining us tonight. Uh, and he is a, a brilliant uh, audio engineer who I had to hire to basically um, do all these things that... Uh, I promised we could do that I didn't actually know how to do myself. Um, so we, uh, yeah, we commenced with a, uh, initially we were hired to do a two month study to have a custom designed microphone. And uh, Caesar and I developed this custom design, presented it uh, at JPL. And actually this was the day that presentation took place. And these are our smiles of, uh, thank, <laughs> thank God we're done with that. Cause it was, you know, it was pretty nerve wracking. Um, and uh, just prior to going out for drinks afterwards. Um, but we made our presentation and then uh, basically four months later, we were informed that um, they, 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 the idea was good for a custom design for microphone. However, uh, the budget just wasn't there to build something from scratch. So instead we got hired back this time to do uh, a select, to help make a selection of an off the shelf component to fly on the Rover. And um, the Ingenuity team mentioned there's some off the shelf components on the helicopter as well. Uh, the microphone that uh, we flew is almost completely off the shelf. And in fact, I don't know if you can see um, right here, my screen. This is uh, a flight model of that microphone that I have on loan from JPL right now. Um, sounds pretty good. It's a condenser microphone. Um, it's a studio mic. It's something you find in studios all over the world. It is absolutely not meant to fly in space. Um, it's not meant to go to a harsh, you know, frigid desert climate. It's not meant to uh, survive in deep space or be irradiated through cosmic radiation or survive a rocket launch or uh, re-entry uh, into another planet. And yet somehow this thing has managed to work. So uh, this is made by a company called DPA Microphones. Uh, they did a wonderful job just designing this thing. They obviously, they didn't build it for this, but uh, it did the job. And uh, we basically reviewed the specs on this thing and a lot of other microphones they had in their uh, catalog. We decided this was the best one and this is ultimately what got flown and, and has worked. Um, let's see, we got, uh, this is a cool picture of, if you look close, this is a vacuum chamber at JPL and, um, uh, there is a, that little white spot, that, that little white thing, and that's a speaker. And, uh, on the left and on the right are the two we had, we, we, we finally narrowed our selection down to two microphones. It was, uh, this one and another one it was very similar. And so those, those were both put in this vacuum chamber and they were both tested, um, I don't know, I don't believe it went down to Mars temperature, but I know that they, they backfilled the atmosphere with the chemical composition on Mars, which is mostly carbon dioxide, and uh, basically just made sure that, you know, it was gonna not rupture the diaphragm if we brought it down to vacuum, that sort of thing. And um, anyway, these tests were performed and, and they, they both microphones survived, so ultimately, that led us to make the selection of this. 
Um, let's see. So there were some other tests that were performed by myself and another engineer, Mike Hoagie, uh, and we did this in a, a backyard in Reseda. Um, you'll see. A <laughs> so, you know, it's funny because you think, okay, this is rocket science, right? Everything's got to be done like in the photo you saw before. But a lot of things are done in an ambient setting. Um, for this, you know, we wanted to, we were trying to test how the chassis of the rover itself might affect the sounds that might bounce off of it, especially the louder sounds, like when the rockets were firing and stuff. So this was, uh, we put together some pieces of metal uh, and actually carefully measured this stuff. It doesn't look like it, but uh, there you go. This is going off of CAD drawings and that we had of the, uh, how the microphone was mounted onto the rover body. And basically the point of this, we set a big full range speaker system about a meter away from this, two meters. Um, blasted a bunch of white noise, a bunch of different test tones. And then depending on that sound, sort of bounces off, reflects off this metal, and then gets captured by the microphone. It can sort of affect things and change them from how they're supposed to sound. And the whole idea behind this is that we wanted to create an algorithm that could account for these sounds and help. Uh, we could basically then apply a sound correction algorithm to things to basically return them back to normal so they would sound more true to what you would really hear if you somehow had your head sticking out on the surface of the planet and you could hear this. Um, let's see, we got a couple. So as with any test, you also need a uh, control mic. So this is a freestanding mic that was mounted uh, a few meters away and also the same capsule, of course. And the whole point of this is to ultimately, ultimately produce something that looks like that. And that's a frequency correction chart that sort of shows you all the squirrely and squiggly stuff that's going wrong with the signal that you had and then um, helps you correct for it. So uh, that was, now this this mainly applies to if you have really loud signals, which again, we, we don't normally, um, but this was primarily designed to correct audio during the landing sequence. Um, now, <laughs> unfortunately, we did not capture that audio during the landing sequence. Um, there was a problem internally, and I, I was not involved on this part of the system, so I can't speak exactly to this, but basically there was an issue with uh, the digitizer and the onboard computer not speaking to each other correctly. So unfortunately, this audio from the landing sequence was not captured. Um, however, uh, thankfully, uh, Dave Gruel, who you saw earlier, and his team of engineers uh, fired the microphone back up uh, over the weekend before that press conference. Uh, and it turned out that the microphone, the hardware was working fine. This time they were able to get a signal and they got that first gust of wind. Um, that was on Soul 2. And now actually um, we have, are you able to play that audio now? We have a, uh, on Soul 16, uh, this audio was captured on the surface. This was 14 days later. And yeah, so this is my engineering team. Uh, we basically took the audio that was returned from JPL once it was publicly released and cleaned it up a bit for people to hear a little better. And uh, so that's that's some that's some crazy sounds right there. All right, that's pretty good. Um, we can, uh, so basically, you know, why is sound important? Well, I think it's important because it's cool, um, obviously, but there's scientific reasons and there's diagnostic reasons um, why sound is important. Uh, you know, generally speaking in life, a lot of times the first time you can tell something's wrong with your car, your refrigerator, whatever, is because it starts making a weird, some sort of wonky knocking sound or something like that. Um, in the case of this audio, th these sounds were something that nobody expected to hear, that, that sort of weird grinding sound. And a lot of engineers uh, at JPL have been trying to figure out what those sounds are. And they also have matching telemetry data to, uh, that they can basically line up so they can see what sensors were reading what when they hear those sounds. And then based on how you line these things up, you can start to try and figure out what you're hearing. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff. And, uh, you know, today, I guess the last thing I'll just very quickly talk about before we get some questions. Today is all about the helicopter. Everyone's very excited about this. It's an incredibly exciting time. 
Um, what does this have to do with sound? Well, as it turns out, uh, that little helicopter has to spin those rotors incredibly fast. And yes, it's very tiny, um, but when you rev something up at the speeds we're talking about, it, it actually can produce quite a lot of noise. And uh, we have, my team was uh, given one of the audio samples when they set the video cameras in that, that video you guys saw earlier of the helicopter flying in the, in the vacuum chamber. Um, I think it was a GoPro or something that they had. They had a camera set up and you know, one of the many cameras and they had a microphone on it. So we were sent that audio to, to check out. Um, I cannot show you guys that because I don't have clearance to share that with you. Um, however, we did do uh, a spectral analysis of it. And this is what an audio uh, spectrum analysis looks like if anybody's curious. Um, those sort of bright yellow bands sort of going from bottom to top are the uh, harmonic frequency nodes of the fundamental frequency, which is the one at the lowest area there, which is at about 86 hertz. And then basically any sort of motor or anything with a lot of harmonics will produce this crazy, it's a very cool pattern. It's basically, it goes up in every 86 hertz, you get another frequency band there. And when you stack all those sounds together, you get your typical sort of, uh, motor sound or these like a kind of sound. And that's, you know, basically what it sounded like. Um, this is a less exciting graph of it, but those little peaks coincide with all those frequency nodes. And the lowest one there, it's a little hard to see from this chart, but uh, once we did an audio comparison, we then did this analysis and it turned out it was 86 Hertz on the nose. Now, the reason that's good is because I mentioned earlier, uh, sound falls off quickly with distance, right? So this thing is noisy, but it's gonna be deposited, I think 115 meters, 115 meters away is how far away the rover's gotta back off before they fly this thing. So that the odds of it flying up and smacking into it are, are very, very low. That's, that's the main reason they're getting this far away. Uh, according to some analysis we've done, which these images are part of, there is a good chance we might actually be able to hear this thing as well as whatever imaging takes place. So no promises, I'm not giving any promises here. And um, this is totally up to the engineering team uh, at JPL and we'll see what they're able to capture, but there is interest in capturing this audio. And uh, it was recently mentioned in an article at space.com that they might actually try and do this on this first flight. So like you guys, I'm just as excited to see uh, what we capture, but we might be able to hear something. It'll probably be very faint very muffled, but we might hear this low frequency uh, rumble of 86 Hertz and, and these, you know, corresponding frequencies. Um, the high stuff will, it will get very muffled, but you might hear sort of like a kind of sound. So anyway, that's, um, there you go. Science rock and roll. That's the end of my slideshow. And uh, I wanted to keep it short today because I know we were running a little short on time. So, um, very exciting stuff. Uh, should I hit stop screen, I guess? Is that how I do this? I'll, I'll take it down. Okay. Yeah, there we um, go. So yeah, uh, <laughs> I know I kind of barreled through that real quick, but um, yeah, does, if anybody has any questions or, um, yeah. Yeah, they've got questions. Um, <laughs> so you were talking, you were talking, also also your your buddy Caesar is also uh, answering some questions in there oh too, Caesar so, so yeah so if you, you guys want to know anything about this audio Caesar actually can answer your questions much better than I can but I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll do it again but yeah Caesar in the chat room he's you know he knows his stuff yeah um so you were just talking about like we might be able to hear the helicopter um would yeah. that be able to be heard on the live stream or do you have to kind of get the sound back and apply your algorithm before it. Before you know, I, 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 I wasn't even aware they were doing a live stream. Um, so yeah. uh, I would imagine, I, I, I wouldn't imagine that that would be something that they would try and incorporate. I, I, I'm speaking out of turn. I don't know. I would not expect that. Um, right. Also, uh, any audio that is captured. So the rover, one of the things we've heard in both the audio samples um, is that the rover makes a lot of self noise. There's there's pumps on board and there's, yeah. um, even if it's not roving. So what we heard before was it moving, right? But even when it's sitting still, there's like a whirring sound that will, even though it's very quiet, it'll probably be 
as loud as anything we're going to hear from 345 feet away uh, on Mars. Um, so I would imagine that it'll probably have to be processed similar to how we processed that audio that you shared earlier. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I would not expect that to be live streamed. Again, I don't know. Okay. Um, Maybe but in the future. I, if, we, if we can hear anything, I think it will be really, really incredible. But I think the, I think it is possible, yeah. Okay. Um, and then when you get, you know, these raw audio files like sent back to you, like what form are they in and how long does it take you to turn it into the beautiful sounds we heard a little so, a while ago? Well, so I'm, yeah, my contract actually ended the day of the press conference. So the only audio uh, I was ever sent back directly from NASA was, um, I, I did get to hear the, the first sounds of Mars before uh, mm -hmm. that was publicly released. And we actually did process process that and send that back. But that, that audio file that uh, you played earlier, which we, you know, processed. We actually downloaded downloaded that from the NASA website, and okay. anybody can do that. Um, and I'm sure the uh, if there is any helicopter audio, it'll be up there as well. Um, it's uh, mars.nasa.gov, and then there's a multimedia button at the top, and you just click audio. And everything's laid out there, including the audio from the SuperCam instrument as well. Um, yeah, and it's uh, it's a wave file. I'd have to I'd have to look back up, but it was it was decent resolution yeah um wasn't like an mp3 or anything so <laughs> um so do you know anything about the the second audio system you said that you were involved with was it also made from existing industrial parts so um, do you know well i know that it's it's a uh, it's an electric microphone so it's a different yeah. it's it's a different construction that so ours is a this guy Harry. we can see a little better now that we got the screen bigger well, it's a little blurry. Um, move it up a little. I, I literally got a gaff tape to a microphone stand. <laughs> okay. But hey, listen. This Wait, is the not one the that first, you're using is that. This is not the first time duct tape has been used on a on a on a okay. satellite. I'm just saying. Uh, okay. What's that? Oh, it's just. Wait, you mentioned that that one you have right there. Is that the one that you put on the rover? Or? This this is this is or a is duplicate the of the model? flight model. So this is one oh, where cool. like it's got a special brass. Uh, plate that helped mount it in case. Yeah. So I can't really, yeah. And then this is actually yeah. the preamp, the corresponding preamp, which you, I, you saw a picture of in the slides there, but yeah. that's, this goes inside the Rover. So one of the reasons we chose this uh, product, the DPA preamp and microphone is because this preamp can actually be housed internally. So the only thing that had to be on the outside of the Rover and really subjected to the horrible atmosphere, Martian atmosphere. It was just this little piece here, which is, you know, it's about the size of my thumb. Uh, but the, yeah, the SuperCam microphone, it's an electric microphone. So um, I think it has a, it's a Mylar, Mylar Teflon, you know, diaphragm, uh, which will cause a different kind of frequency response. Also the digitizer associated with the SuperCam instrument, I believe has a I believe it has a high and low shelf of 100 hertz to 10,000 hertz, which the 10,000 hertz doesn't matter. We're not going to hear anything above that anyway on Mars. But 100 hertz and below, I believe, also gets shaved off because of the computer itself, whereas ours is, well, ours is a little more full range. Um, it's cool that these two different microphones of different construction are on here because at some point, one of these things is going to give out. Uh, you know, none of they're not built for this. Um, right. So it'll be really interesting to see which one lasts longer and and how it sounds and how it fares, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that cool. second one, the SuperCam is run by the French Space Agency, or uh, they, they did a lot of work on it. And so people can find information about that um, probably, yeah, online website, NASA, NASA stuff. Cool. Um, and then, so it sounds like, you were just kind of a big, I don't know, NASA fan before you <laughs> were involved. So how, <laughs> how, did, how did I, I get mean, this how, job? Is that, is yeah, that how did you get the job? What did you What did you say in the pitch to convince NASA yeah. that, that you were you the know, guy? Yeah, I, I basically, um, I did a lot, I mean, I did do a lot of research. I did about six months of research before I really started, you know, putting myself forward. But yeah, I, I basically started writing every writing or calling every engineer 
person I could think of that was involved with uh, what it was that back then it was called Mars 2020. They didn't have the Perseverance name yet. Right. Um, but once I found out that there was interest in flying a microphone or actually two different microphones, I wrote both teams. Um, I basically, the way I try and explain it is that audio is, is interesting because it's the science of audio is, is a lot of it doesn't take place on the page. You can, like, so when I'm working in my studio, if I'm recording a snare drum, you, you, you can mathematically parcel, part and parcel out where you want to put that microphone, where it's going to sound great. And then you hit the snare drum and you listen back and it sounds like crap, <laughs> you know, and, and you just have to move things around. You have to adjust things. And there's, there's a lot about audio that is counterintuitive as well. Um, the fact that things are sounding as good on Mars as they are right now, I think it surprises a lot of people. And people would ask me, well, aren't you surprised? And I said, well, no, because I, I did look at the, the data and, and um, you know, I looked at the frequency response charts. And even though they look like they shave off all the high end and you're not going to hear anything, when you look at the actual frequencies that are going to be well represented, it, it, it correlates with what you're hearing. So I kind of tried to pitch myself as somebody who was, you know, familiar with the counterintuitive aspect of audio. And plus, I think they just did, really didn't have anybody, <laughs> you know? Um, so it, it all worked out. And uh, it's been working there for the last four years as an independent uh, consultant uh, with Caesar and Mike and, and uh, Brad, uh, another, um, Brad Avenson was our third tech. Uh, it's just been incredible. It's a great honor. Yeah, it's been awesome. Awesome. Um, well, thanks so much for being with us uh, tonight. And um, yeah, I can't wait to hear more from from the rover. Well, we'll see, A, how long this thing keeps working for, B, how much we <laughs> turn it on. And, um, you know, we might get something back next week. And if we do get something, definitely I'll, I'll put it to my team and we'll process that audio and see if we can clean it up and make it sound real sharp. So, uh, awesome. but... It, Whatever happens, it's a, it's just an incredible time. It's very exciting stuff. So, yeah, yeah. we're yeah. all lucky. You're all lucky <laughs> because we get to see and hear all this stuff. Just yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. When I was a kid, the space shuttle was flying around, you know, and like that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, you know. So mm -hmm. putting these big yeah. car-sized rovers on on Mars now is really, uh, yeah, it's 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 cool. It's good stuff. Okay. Uh, well, we'll see you at the uh, the helicopter live stream. Oh yeah, I'll I'll, I'll be, we'll be watching. Maybe, we'll, maybe we'll, be watching. we'll hear something. Yeah, it'd be that'd be a nice yeah. surprise. <laughs> okay, awesome. I'm gonna bring Lynn back. Thanks so much, Jason. Thanks all. <laughs> hey, Lynn. Hi. That was fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight and special thanks to Mary, Vandy, Winnie, Dorsa, and Jason. Um, looks like there's a lot coming up. So everyone stay tuned to all the Mars adventures in the next few months. Uh, for next week though, we'll be exploring what it's like to illustrate science, um, learn how visual artists have helped further our understanding of the unseeable. So from explorations in the 1500s and paleo art, to quantum physics and the cutting edge of science today. Um, so join us next week. Um, yeah, I'm especially excited for next week. So we don't usually put in like personal plugs, but I'm gonna do it because I'm really excited and we've been wanting to do a science illustration one for a while. So um, I'm also I'm gonna drop to the Yeah, <laughs> I'm also gonna drop the link to the um, helicopter live stream um, the Mars helicopter live stream in the chat again, because I know a lot of people want to watch. Um, but yeah, subscribe to our YouTube channel, please. Uh, if so, you'll be notified when we come back. Um, what else do I usually say? The Academy is open. Um, so if you're in the Bay Area, we'd love to see you. Nightlife will let you know when Nightlife is back in the building. You can come um, hang out at night. And then, um, but we're still, we've been closed for a year. So if you're comfortable doing so, we would really, really, really appreciate your support. Um, there's a link to the Academy Resilience Fund um, in the, the YouTube description. So um, thank you so much. I'm gonna just post the link right now before we're,
fun. Thank you for the comments and my nirvana tea. And um, see you all next week. <laughs> good night. Have a good night.